All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Once again, this is Mary Dyer uh, from the Finance Authority of Maine, and I'm a financial education officer here at FAME. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to our Wednesday webinar this month, Financial Fundamentals for Young Adults, First Steps Towards Financial Wellness. Um, we're really thrilled that in recognition of April as Financial Literacy Month, we have a number of events, um, workshops, and outreach events going on. And we're also thrilled to be able to host this month's webinar in recognition of Financial Literacy Month. So thank you so much for joining. Um, just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. I did upload a new handout. Um, so in your webinar um, dashboard, you should be able to see the new presentation. I will also be recording the webinar and I'll be sending out uh, the recording for folks who've registered but weren't able to join. And we will make the webinar materials and the presentation available as well. Um, so certainly we'll send along any follow-up materials um, after the webinar has concluded. If, if you have questions as we move through the webinar, please feel free to use the question feature um, in your um, GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, and if, as we move through, if I see any questions, I'll try to address those. And uh, otherwise, if we aren't able to address them during the webinar, certainly I will provide you with a follow-up uh, response after the webinar concludes. All right, so let's just go ahead and get started. It's always interesting um, doing the, these types of presentations via webinar because, of course, um, you're all out there and registered and listening, but I can't hear you or uh, see you. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to make this um, valuable as, and as engaging as possible given the webinar um, technology that we're using. So today's goal, really the goal of this webinar, is to provide you with key steps and strategies to help you support your students in strengthening their financial capability. That's really the, the goal for this webinar. We'll spend the next 45 minutes to an hour or so going through the key um, first steps that we think are most important to be able to establish um, financial habits early on in life. Um, one of the things I just want to mention is that obviously the topic of financial capability um, is a very broad topic and there's a lot of information that we can provide to students. Um, but what we like to do or what I like to do personally when I'm working with students, uh, young adults, whether they're in high school or in college, is to really avoid um, the fire hose approach where you're giving them a ton of information um, all at once. So perhaps you may have the luxury of having an entire semester with a group of students or a few weeks with a group of students. It, that's great. And if that's your format, um, you know, certainly you can give students lots of information when you have a lot of time with them. I think that for most of us, we generally have about an hour or so or a class period, perhaps freshman orientation. Um, perhaps a classroom workshop in the high school um, affiliated with a career week. For most of us, and certainly our staff um, here at FAME, we don't generally have, uh, you know, several weeks or days with the students. So what I've tried to do in this presentation and what we try to do with most of our presentations with students is to really focus on the key elements to help them get started. And again, really trying to avoid overwhelming them um, with a lot of information all at once. So really, I think honing in on what is most important and what is critical upfront is, is really a good approach to take um, for engagement. And so we'll kind of go through those, but in terms of um, the agenda items, you know, I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, some tools to make the case. I'll do a quick refresher um, of the main learning standards, the main learning results, just as a reminder that personal finance and economics are included, and so we'll, we'll cover that briefly. I'll also take you through an activity that we do with students at the beginning of a money management workshop or um, personal finance session, just to get them thinking, and we sort of treat it as a homework assignment, and, and I'll go through that. And then we'll take you through the five key steps to establish early that, that high school college and young adults should be establishing early. And again, this is not an exhaustive list 
of early steps. These are just the um, first steps that we think are critically important um, as we begin to work with students. One of the things I'll be doing as we move through each of the topics is you'll notice at the bottom of each slide I'm providing, with, providing you with resources that you can use in support of the key concept that we're covering. And again, I will send you some links as a follow-up, the presentation, and some additional resources as well. Once we've gone through the presentation, I'll also take you through um, some additional resources that we think are helpful and then some training opportunities that are coming up that are going to be very valuable for those of you who are um, working with students around issues of financial capability. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so what are high school students saying? Um, a lot of folks in the industry, I'll hear them say um, fairly regularly that um, high school students, uh, college students, young adults, that they're not really interested in the topic, that they're really disconnected and they don't understand the importance or recognize the importance of financial wellness. And I think that all of us um, here at FAME and, and our outreach team would, would probably um, say something contrary to that. I think that what we find is that depending on how it's delivered and depending on the strategies that are used, we find that young adults are very engaged and very interested in, in the topic. Um, and so one thing I wanted to share with you was a, a 2013 survey that was published by Discover Pathway um, and it was in regards to financial success and a survey that they did with young adults. And what was really interesting about the survey results is that high school seniors ranked personal finance and money management as one of the most critical skills um, for their future success. They um, actually ranked it as high as math, the math skills, um, and ahead of science and technology. So contrary to what we believe in terms of students thinking, you know, this is a boring topic and they don't understand the value, um, this study really emphasized the fact that students believe very strongly that it's important. And I've had many, many students say to me um, when they're in college, you know, I really wish that I'd had a class. I wish that I had had an opportunity um, to have this information while I was in school. 50% um, of them in the survey wish that they'd learned personal finance in school, feeling that it really prepares them for future life, um, certainly in college and beyond. And 83% said that they would be very interested in learning more about how to manage their personal finances. Um, so again, college students, high school students, they feel very strongly that this is a critical topic. I certainly think that parents um, often express the, the need for this content um, to be included in the high school curriculum. Um, and so this, this I wanted to include because I think it just is important to recognize what high school students and young adults are saying. Now, despite this, um, according to a recent study conducted by NextGen Personal Finance, um, only 50% of Maine high school students actually have access to a standalone personal finance course, and only about 20% have access to a graduation requirement. So NextGen Personal Finance is a nonprofit organization. We'll talk about them later, and I'll show you their resources. But they conducted a national study of high schools to look at what high school students have access to. And that's what they found here in Maine specifically. Um, so despite what we all recognize as a, a critical topic and critical content, um, the majority of Maine students don't have access to a standalone course. And a graduation requirement is, is very unique um, among most Maine high schools. So let's just uh, briefly do a quick refresher in terms of the main learning results or the main learning standards. And just um, as a reminder, personal finance and economics is required in the main learning results. It's included in the MLRs in the social studies um, section as part of the economics strand. And essentially what that strand indicates is that students will draw on concepts and processes from economics to understand issues of personal finance, issues of production, distribution, and consumption in the community, Maine, the United States, and in the world. Um, so again, it's included in that economic strand. However, the Maine learning results allows for a great deal of flexibility in terms of where the personal finance and economics content is included. So that it does allow for multiple pathways. It can be included in a social studies 
um, course. It can be included in math, business. I mean, there's, there's a great deal of flexibility in terms of how schools implement the standards. However, in terms of the main learning results document and the framework, it is included in that, in that social studies section. In the MLRs, personal finance is defined as the aspects of individuals or family life that involve earning, spending money, um, often includes making budget choices, savings and investing, the use of credit, and managing risk and insurance. And so you'll also see that I included on this slide the main learning results key concepts. Um, and obviously this, these, these concepts should come as no surprise to you, earning money, spending money, budgeting, savings and investing, using credit, managing risk and insurance, those are the key concepts. And again, upon conclusion of the webinar, I will send you the main learning results and a framework document um, that we recently created in partnership with Maine Department of Education that will help you in terms of implementation. So again, I included this just to reinforce that, yes, indeed, personal finance and economics is included in the main learning results. Schools are required to include it, but in terms of implementation and how these standards are implemented, that is um, dictated by the district and the school themselves. Um, and so I will provide some follow-up resources, but it's up to the school and the district to determine how they will implement the standards. But always important um, to sort of, um, you know, as a reminder that this is included. One other thing I want to note is it's not just included at the high school level. Um, personal finance and economics is included throughout the K-12 um, spectrum. So it's not just that, you know, 9 through 12 grade level. It's also included at K-4 and in middle school. Um, and again, we'll provide those um, resources to you as a follow-up. So let's dive into um, the, the key steps that we um, provide as we're working with students. Um, one of the things that I do at the beginning of most of my presentations is I really encourage students to think about their future self. Um, and, and this really goes a long way at helping them to begin to set goals, um, both personal, educational, and financial goals. Um, but I always begin my presentations with this activity. Um, and sometimes we do it as part of the workshop. Generally speaking, I assign it as a homework assignment um, because I don't usually have a lot of time with students um, to go through the activity. And it's really something that we want them to work on and really to begin to develop a narrative. Um, so what we ask them to do, and you can change obviously the age um, depending on the group that you're working with, but we want them to really begin to think about their future self, begin to imagine themselves you know, at 30 or 10 years from whatever um, age group that you're working with. We want them to really think about what will matter to them at that point, you know, 10 years into the future. Um, and, and we want them to fill in a lot of detail. So, you know, we don't want them to just have this sort of broad statement that I want to be rich or I want to be living in um, a big city or, you know, these sort of broad general statements, we want them to kind of avoid that. And instead, what we want them to do is really um, to begin to think about what will matter to them. Um, where will they be living? Will they want their own apartment or will they... Um, be owning a home? Where do they expect um, to be working? Where would they like to be working? Um, will they be a stay-at-home parent? Um, what will their schedule look like? In our Managing Your Money Guide, which is a free publication that you can order from the FAME website, we actually have a worksheet um, that they can fill out where it encourages them to think about their future self. And so they can go through and answer a series of questions. And the reason that we really want them to fill in the detail is there is a psychological um, thing that we all do, and it's, it's called psychological distance. And basically, in a nutshell, it's, it's the um, situation where, for all of us, things that are in the far distant future, we tend not to put a lot of emphasis or detail um, 
into those sort of future activities. The things that are more immediate, we tend to do a lot of immediate planning and we fill in a lot of detail around whatever that um, activity is. So think about it as a vacation. Imagine that you're going on a vacation and imagine that the vacation is a year away. So at that point when the vacation is a year away, you know, you're thinking more big picture. You know, how will you get there? Uh, you know, what kind of money uh, might you need? What kind of activities? Um, you're, not a lot of detail. But as the vacation becomes closer, and I'm thinking about that for myself, I have a vacation coming up, and a year ago it was, you know, a really distant thought. I'm going to San Diego, and I'm going to stay here. But there wasn't a lot of detail. Now that the vacation is only a week or two away, I'm really thinking more specifically about travel, activities, food, what will I need? And so that's the whole concept around psychological distance. Things that are far away, we don't attach a lot of detail and strategy to. The things that are more immediate, um, you know, we're really um, focusing on and, and providing a lot of detail. And when it comes to personal finance, um, how we conduct ourselves in, um, you know, currently strongly impacts our future self. And so the more that we can uh, limit that psychological distance between now and in the future when it comes to finances, the better off that we'll, that we'll be. The more that I spend time thinking about my, my future self, my, my retired uh, Mary Dyer, and the more details that I fill in now, about my future self, the more likely I am to um, reach those financial and personal goals. So we want students to do that. We want them to really begin to build a narrative of what they see their future self looking like. Um, the other thing we really want them to do is what, what is, really think about what is it gonna take for you to get there? What are the steps needed? Um, and then with that, what could derail you? What, what might slow you down and what tactics um, might you put into place to prevent that? Um, so this is a really important first um, activity, to have them really stop and think about where they'd like to be. Um, the other thing that I really think is important is to help them begin to think about their money mindset. Um, really, when it comes to financial wellness and financial capability, obviously um, knowledge is a huge part of the equation in terms of being successful. But the other piece that's critically important is also our emotions and our behavior and our psychology. And so to have them, you know, really begin to connect with their own money mindset and understand what drives their emotions around money and their behavior around money is really, really important. One of my favorite resources to kind of get you started on this is a great book by Sarah Newcomb. Um, it's called Loaded. And it's money psychology and how to get ahead without leaving your values behind. And Sarah Newcomb is a behavioral economics expert who really has spent uh, her life studying the psychology of money. And she um, received her PhD from the University of Maine and has done a lot of work with us here at FAME to help us better understand this topic. Um, right now she's working um, with Morningstar Hello Wallet to help them um, include behavioral economics and the psychology of money in their resources and materials. So I strongly encourage you to um, check out Sarah's book called Loaded because it, it does a great job um, of giving you kind of an overview of the impact of um, behavioral economics on our financial behavior. Um, I think it's a great book to get you started on the topic, but there is a whole school and of, of you know, thought and knowledge around behavioral economics and how that really isn't the driver in terms of our financial success. So that's really a great place to start and, and a, a great sort of um, kickoff to a financial uh, workshop that you might be doing. The next thing that we want to be sure, and this is a tricky one, um, you know, learning the art of delayed gratification um, is something that many of us have learned at home. Um, and if we didn't learn it at home from our parents, we've, we've learned it through a process of trial and error, or perhaps we haven't learned it at all. So I think one of the most important money management strategies is to really learn the, um, 
you know, the art of patience, to really understand opportunity costs. You know, what are you giving up um, or delaying in favor of a future opportunity? This is a critically important skill, and I, and I recognize it's not easy in the world of technology and iPhones and instant um, gratification in, in our hands. Um, certainly technology, I think, has made it harder for us all to be patient in terms of how we access information and how we socialize with each other. And so because of that, I think it's more important than ever to impart um, the art of patience on our children, our students, and, and young adults. Um, we want them, ideally, by learning that skill, to avoid impulse purchases. Um, you know, no matter how large or small the purchase is, we want them to delay um, those, those impulse purchases. I think a really great um, tactic is to get your students into the habit of waiting a day or two before they purchase something. Um, for those of you who are parents or have young adults in your life or children in your life, I think that avoiding um, impulse purchases every time you walk into a store um, you know, taking your child into a store and having them walk out empty-handed is a really valuable skill. Um, we also want them to understand that using credit cards isn't a, a solution. Uh, we don't want them to purchase things that they can't afford, uh, afford. And certainly, the access to credit cards, um, you know, makes that a little more difficult. So I think that really, we all do this as we're working with students in a variety of different ways. Um, some of the things that you're all doing, you know, as you're working with students day to day is when you set expectations and you hold them accountable, um, that's, that's a really important way to teach them um, the art of patience. Obviously, anything that you can um, provide them in terms of learning responsibility and earning privileges, you know, that, that if you work on this, there will be this reward as an outcome. Those are all really powerful things to do. I think one of the most um, important sort of life skills that help students with this is to be working while they're in high school and in college. I think that working is one of the most important ways that young adults learn um, personal finance skills, and it helps to build um, that delayed gratification because you're working and after a week or so of working or two weeks depending on the pay um, schedule then you get a paycheck and you know they very quickly um, begin to learn responsibility and financial skills um, so this is a really important skill for students the resources that I've provided next gen personal finance and we'll take a look at their website um, has some wonderful case studies that you can use with students um, as icebreakers or as classroom workshop activities. Um, also, I think that it's really important on this topic to show them and not just tell them. And so any of the uh, online calculators that you can use, Bankrate has a really great credit card calculator that allows you to put in um, you know, a, a, an estimated purchase or a credit card balance and demonstrate over, the, over time the impact of making um, the minimum payment. So certainly any online calculators that you can show to students really emphasize this and other financial points. They are better off being shown and having you demonstrate it, um, not only in your own sort of financial habits, but in the classroom than it is to just tell them. So, so showing them is really powerful. The other thing I wanted to recommend, it's really fun, there's a, several different TED Talks on the Marshmallow Test. Um, and of course, many of you are probably very familiar with um, a, the study that was done many, many years ago where um, five-year-olds were brought into a room and a marshmallow was placed in front of them and they were told, if, you know, you can either eat this marshmallow now or if you wait, you'll have more, more marshmallows later. And there's a great um, body of research around the marshmallow test, um, but it's a really great tool um, video to show to students as well in terms of um, the art of delayed gratification. All right, so then the next thing we, we really think is very important um, for students is 
to help them understand the importance of taking charge of their personal financial um, matters. Uh, I, I struggle with this one with my own son who is 18 and so I fully understand um, this sometimes difficult to give up the control and to motivate them to take charge. But this is a really important um, strategy and, and step. I think all of you, the professionals that are on the phone who are working in colleges, I think you can really attest to the importance of this. And so we, we encourage students to get involved, you know, in high school, certainly in college. We want them to either complete their own FAFSA or help their parents complete the FAFSA, you know, be sitting next to their parents if their parents are doing it. Um, we want them to engage and fill out their own scholarship applications, fill out their own student loan forms. Um, one of the things we say to them is, you know, in the case of student loans, these are your loans. You'll be paying them back. So it's really important to get involved with the process. We also want them to begin to get into the habit of reading and responding to all notices that they receive from colleges and or any of the financial um, companies that they're working with. That's a really important um, strategy as well. We, we want them to, um, you know, certainly getting a checking and savings account is um, vital in helping them um, begin to have some experience with financial products and obviously monitoring um, their checking and savings account, monitoring transactions online are also um, very important as well. And then the last thing that we want to emphasize is that they want to really take an active role in following up on any billing or financial um, related calls or inquiries. And it's a really good habit to get into, um, you know, recording um, any conversations that they've had, any additional steps um, that they um, need to take, any additional instructions, and ideally who they talked to as well. Um, so some resources for that. We think it's a really good habit for students to get into regularly reviewing their annual credit report, um, and that's something that they can begin doing in high school. Um, some additional resources that I think are valuable to share with um, your students um, are some of the wonderful adulting tools and resources um, that are out there. So the Young Invincibles have a great site and um, some great uh, tools around becoming um, directly involved in your financial matters, um, making sure that you have um, you know, active, an active role in all of the financial matters um, that, that you're involved in. So specifically financial aid is a great example, but there are many, many other um, ways to get students involved as well. All right, just going to take a quick look to see if um, there are any questions. I don't see any um, questions at the moment, so we'll continue on. Um, this next topic is one that I think, regardless of the age of the students that you're working with, whether they are middle school, high school, college students, or adults, I think this is probably one of the best um, tactics and strategies that you can provide to students. Um, and that is to get them to begin thinking about their personal spending leaks and ways that they can control their spending leaks. Um, it's, it's important that students understand that it's not necessarily what you earn, it's what you spend. Um, we need to remind them of that on a regular basis um, and remind them that as they're looking around, you know, at their peers and in their community, family members, friends, um, to not assume that just because somebody you know, looks to have a lot of, like, you know, a lot of material wealth or a lot of, um, you know, money to, to remind them that it isn't always um, the case. So you can't necessarily judge a book by its cover. One of the things that I find that high school students um, can really relate to is when you give them examples of famous musicians or athletes who are multimillionaires and then eventually end up filing bankruptcy. 
Um, and there's an endless list of examples that you can provide to them. And it really emphasizes the point that it's not necessarily what you're earning, it's what you're spending. Um, and to, to remind them of that as you go through these workshops and activities. I think it's also important to remind them that, that the concept of the millionaire next door, that you know sometimes you know, uh, it isn't always about the biggest house or the newest, fanciest car, um, and that there are people around them in their communities who have a lot of money who may not look like they have a lot of money because they're saving and they're making really wise decisions for their future. So again, constantly you know, emphasizing it's not what you earn, it's what you spend. Really, really important. Um, so in that, to that end, I think that having students go through the activity of tracking every penny that they spend for an entire month is critically important. A lot of students will tell me, well, I don't really have any money. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I'm broke. But the reality is, most students do have discretionary spending. Um, when we poll students, we find that their discretionary spending often is going toward food, um, fast food, restaurant, you know, quick counter purchases, and coffee. Um, so that's something that I think to take them through an activity where they track every penny that they spend, sometimes you know, it will be for a week or two weeks at a time if it's tied to a course. But I think the most valuable way of doing it is to have them track for an entire month. And then from there, we want them to categorize their spending and add up all of their expenses and kind of put it into buckets so that they can really determine what their personal spending leaks are. The goal is that we want them to understand that small purchases add up over time and those small purchases become big purchases. And so I think, again, getting students to connect with that concept is really important. And some of the resources, and I want to show you one of the calculators that we often use called Break the Starbucks Habit, um, but Smart About Money has some great spending leaps um, resources, and Simple Dollar also has some wonderful resources. This is an area where showing them, not telling them, is critically important. And so I want to take you um, real quick to a calculator uh, that we use that I think is really um, phenomenal for students. And, and really, you can use this calculator with any type of purchase. It's set up to really look at coffee purchases, but you could put in any daily purchase, and it will show you the um, long-term impact. So usually what I do in a classroom is I'll ask the students, okay, who's got the worst coffee habit in the room? And usually they're very um, uh, willing to share. And they'll tell me, you know, I buy two cups a day or one cup um, or, you know, whatever amount they, they share with you. And so what you do is you can put in the daily coffee purchase. And I'm just going to assume that they're doing, you know, two cups a day in this calculator. And uh, instead of buying the two cups a day, they're going to brew their coffee at home. And that's going to cost them... Um, 25 cents, and again, that dollar amount fluctuates depending on what kind of coffee you brew at home, what you put in it. Do you use K cups? You know, what are you using? We're going to assume um, one cup a day because we're going to do the the six dollars for the, the two cups. Um, but you can change that if they're spending three dollars a day, um, and but they're or a cup and they're buying two a day, you can you can change the calculator. And then you can build in the typical work year, or you can do 365 days a year. And then you can put in, um, you know, the number of years. So I'm going to do 10 years, and I'm going to assume that this student takes their two cups of coffee a day, and they're going to put it into an investment account. And I'm going to be somewhat conservative. I'm going to put in 6% um, in terms of the yield, and I'm going to calculate this. And so... As we scroll down, and hopefully you can see this on your screen, um, what you'll see is that after one year, they're spending about $2,000 in coffee. After five years, if they invest that daily purchase, they will have $11,316 in investment earnings at that point. And then after 10 years, they have about um, $26,460 um, that they've saved. And so the value of this activity is this clearly demonstrates 
that the small purchase, that menial purchase of $3, what's the big deal, um, can really, really translate into what we would all clearly define as a lot of money. Um, so I would encourage you to use this calculator. I've worked with college students in, in classes who are spending, unbeknownst to them, three or four hundred dollars a month in um, coffee and um, quick purchases. So I love this calculator to demonstrate to them um, the overall impact. So spending leaks are a big topic and one that you want them to really um, you know, have some control over, at least be aware of their spending leaks. It may not mean that they'll stop buying their coffee, but at least um, if they can, you know, be aware of it and maybe make uh, the decision to cut back a little bit, I think all the better. The next strategy that's critically important is the, uh, the emergency or rainy day fund to really encourage your students to begin to establish a regular habit of saving. Um, according to a recent FINRA study, 55% of Mainers do not have a rainy day fund sufficient to cover three months of expenses. And so this is really a huge gap um, in terms of our overall financial wellness. So the sooner that you can begin to get students into the regular habit of saving, um, the better. And I think that the danger of the, you know, the, the financial experts who say, you know, you need to have three to six months of expenses saved, I think the danger of those rules is that we all sort of hear that and we think, wow, that's a lot of money. I can't do that. And then we don't save anything. And so what we want them to do is just start with a small savings goal. Perhaps it's $100. Perhaps it's $500. Have them start with a small goal and then build from there. But this is probably, I think, of all of the five topics that we're, we're touching on today, this is one of the most important. Um, it will help them plan for the unexpected and will help them avoid having to use credit cards um, in, the case, in the case of an emergency. Some great resources related to emergency funding or rainy day fund um, and to, to kickstart that. Again, Next Gen Personal Finance has a great unit on saving. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has a wonderful Money As You Grow, um, Your Money, Your Goals, um, web, a series of web tools and publications. And then Nerd Wallet has some great resources on how to get started on an emergency fund. Um, so lots of um, free tools out there to help with that. And then the last tactic that we focus on, and, and this is really helpful um, as we're working with students um, who, uh, you know, will report to us, you know, I don't have any money to spend, or I, I, you know, I do budget, but I don't have a lot of money. Um, we work with a lot of, um, you know, low-income students in Maine, and so to walk into a classroom and really start to talk to them about investing and savings and retirement and risk management, you know, it, it can be overwhelming. And so what we want to do is provide them with some resources on how can they discover found money for themselves within their current um, situation or current lifestyle. So there are some tactics that regardless of the amount of money that you have, how can you discover found money? And so things that we talk about um, are, first of all, getting the best deal, making sure that you complete an annual checkup of all of your fixed expenses, your fixed regular monthly expenses. Some examples include cell phones, your cable bill, um, your car insurance, and your banking fees. Even credit card interest rates are negotiable. And so we want to be sure that they're getting the best deal. And as anyone can attest to who's gone through this activity can tell you, um, this, is, this is an activity where you can save hundreds of dollars a month. I know that it sounds like a Geico commercial, but it's absolutely true. Um, if you take the time and you go through the process of doing an annual checkup and you negotiate a better deal, you're likely to land a better deal. Uh, most of us instead pick a plan and we kind of set it and forget it. And in all likelihood, we're paying more. And so going through the process of an annual checkup is a really great strategy to discover found money. I encourage high school students and college students to do this in partnership with their families. Um, you know, say to their parents, look, I will find a better cell phone deal or cable um, and I'll save you the money and we'll put it toward books and supplies or whatever the upcoming 
expenses or perhaps savings. Um, students are really savvy when it comes to um, you know, technology options, cable options, those kinds of things. So I think that making that a household activity um, is really a, a great way to approach it. The other thing that we will um, tell them is, you know, and this is particularly helpful, you know, for an 18 year old or a college student, you know, you, you obviously, if you think back of, of, you know, if you're in college, what you've left behind at home, most of us have a lot of unwanted items that may be of value um, to others. So thinking about selling any of the unwanted items that they have to, you know, earn some real cash to help with um, savings, paying down debt, books and supplies, um, whatever the expense is. Things to think about include uh, used athletic equipment, uh, musical equipment, video games, video game consoles, entertainment um, equipment, those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's a, there's a real market for that. And so we encourage students um, to think about unwanted items and, and how to you know, make some money off of those. It's easier than ever with Craigslist and eBay. A lot of colleges have online um, opportunities to sell, um, you know, items on campus. Um, perhaps you host a yard sale. Regardless, I think that, you know, un, you know, unloading all of those unwanted items can really be helpful. The other recommendation is to be thinking about a side hustle. You know, what, what are you good at? What are you really passionate about? Perhaps um, you're great, you know, you're a great photographer. Maybe you're great with kids. Uh, maybe you like to work outside. Uh, you know, think about ways to, um, you know, develop your own sort of side job, um, you know, an entrepreneurial opportunity where you can earn some extra cash. Earning money isn't necessarily um, always tied to a place of employment. So I think it's great for students to think about opportunities for them to create, um, you know, their own side hustle. I encountered a student several years ago who um, had their own auto detailing company. They, they started off with just working with family members and friends and then it got so big that they had to hire other high school students and you know ended up making a lot of money. Um, I read an article recently about a company that was started by a student at Bowdoin College who collects all of the unwanted um, dorm um, you know refrigerators and furniture and all that stuff that gets left behind and refurbishes the the um, items and then resells them. So I think being creative about ways to earn extra money is um, something that you can really, I think, engage students with and it, it may be very motivating. The other thing is we, we want to be sure that they're always taking advantage of freebies and discounts. I mean, as students, especially if they're in college, they have access to a lot of student discounts, a lot of free entertainment and free opportunities on campus. And so we want to be sure that they're um, making sure that you know they're, they're accessing that. I think this is a time when technology is our friend. Um, I tell students don't ever buy anything if it's not on sale. Go on your phone when you're in the store and look for a promo code or a coupon. You shouldn't be buying anything full price and I think technology really helps in that effort. Um, and then the last thing that, and this is a fun activity to do in a classroom when you're with students, is to make sure they check for any unclaimed property. Um, you can have them go to, and you'll see the resource there, um, the state treasurer has um, a direct link. It's main.gov forward slash upsearch. This allows them to look to see if they have any unclaimed property. Unclaimed property might be um, tax refunds that they never received, um, you know, any um, bank accounts that were closed or money that was sitting in a bank account. It could be a life insurance um, policy that they are beneficiary of that they don't know about. So again, this is another great student and family um, activity. I will tell you when I'm in a classroom of 30 students, 40 students, especially college students, um, I would say if you've got 20 in the class, three or four of them have unclaimed property. And if they don't, their parents do. Um, so again, maybe it's only $25, but that's $25 we'd rather have in their pocket um, than sitting in the Office of the Treasurer account. I will tell you my 13-year-old has unclaimed property right now, so it's, it's certainly something that is um, available for you to share with your high school students, 
college students and adults. Um, and it's and again, it's it's one of those motivating activities that gets them thinking about the whole found money concept. So definitely check that out. I hope you'll all check it out for yourselves um, at the conclusion of the webinar because I guarantee of the 20 or so of you that are on the call right now, I'm sure somebody um, has unclaimed property um, that they haven't um, accessed. So those are the five things that I wanted to walk you through. And certainly there are many, many more. FAME's managed publication um, takes them through several other key steps that are important um, in terms of establishing lifelong financial wellness. So that publication, and you'll see a screenshot here of the publication itself, you can order um, the managed publication for free on the FAME website. And um, it's certainly available for a PDF download, but if you want to order the publication, you can have a supply of these to use with your students. Um, in addition to that, the content from the publication is also available on our website. And we do also have a number of companion presentations that we use with the publication as well. Other resources that I want you to be aware of, uh, the National Jumpstart Coalition has uh, national jumpstart standards for K-12, um, which I think are a really valuable tool um, in terms of understanding um, the key uh, concepts that students need to um, receive while they're in school. And then there, it's also set up within the publication key benchmarks that they should be reaching at each grade level. So I encourage you to take a look at that. The main Jumpstart Coalition, and we'll, we'll take a look at these resources in a moment, also has an online clearinghouse of main based resources that are available to you. So if you're looking for a classroom speaker, um, some free resources or games, uh, the main Jumpstart Clearinghouse provides um, a set of resources for you. National Jumpstart has a, a national tool as well, so we'll, we'll take a peek at that. The Finance Authority of Maine, in addition to many other financial literacy resources that we offer, we also have a uh, game that we play with middle and high school students called Claim Your Future. Um, Claim Your Future is available both online and um, through a game kit that we make available to classroom um, educators here in Maine. And we'll take a peek at the Claim Your Future website as well. Um, but if you go to claimyourfuture.com, You'll see um, information about the game kit. There is a video that shows you what the classroom experience um, looks like. You can order a free game kit and you can direct your students to play it online right at claimyourfuture.com. Other resources that I want you to be aware of here in Maine, and again, there's an endless number of them. We're very lucky that we have very high quality resources available. Um, EverFi, the financial literacy program, is available here in Maine for free to schools, both at the middle school and high school level. The Maine Attorney General has purchased EverFi for Maine middle schools and high schools. And so you do have access to EverFi at your school or free through the Attorney General's support. Um, I mentioned the CFPB, the Youth Financial Education Services and resources that they offer are top notch. So I encourage you to take a look at their website. And then the National Endowment for Financial Education, which is also available here in Maine through the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. They have a high school financial planning program and course that's available for free to Maine high schools. And then they also have a college tool called Cash Course um, that I would encourage you to take a look at. So I just want to um, take you to some of these resources real quickly. Um, so that you can kind of see what's out there. If you go to famemain.com, you can hover over the education section and you'll find our money management page. And I'm on that page now. And again, all of the topics in the money management guide um, and, and various resources are there. Also on that site, you can um, play Claim Your Future. It links you right to Claim Your Future. I'll take you there real quick to show you um, the educator resources are available on claimyourfuture.com and that's where you can also request a free game kit 
and um, provide the, um, or, or go through the video that we provided. Um, so you'll find the educator guide, the budget worksheet, and various resources for playing Claim Your Future in the classroom. Contact us is where you'll request a free game kit if that's something that you're interested in. So that's Claim Your Future. And again, uh, as you go through um, the money management resources for professionals, I would encourage you on the FAME website to go to K-12 and hire a um, professional audience. And when you go there, you'll find um, materials and resources for financial education. So everything from our cash and maps um, coloring books and workbooks for younger students, our Claim Your Future game, and then our resources for high school you'll find there. The main Jumpstart website, if you go to mejumpstart.org, this is where you'll find under resources the clearinghouse that I mentioned. So great um, materials there. Um, and a link to the National Jumpstart Clearinghouse and the national standards. You'll also find our training initiatives and all of the resources that are offered um, through training to um, Maine educators. You'll find all of that information there as well. Real quickly, this is just a quick screenshot of the National Jumpstart Clearinghouse. Um, there are over 250,000 resources available through um, the National Jumpstart Clearinghouse, and so I encourage you um, to take a peek at that as well. The NEFI Cash Course, just wanted to show you that resource, and um, you'll go to cashcourse.org to check out NEFI's resources, and you can sign up there to use this at your school. Um, and there's also information on their site about the high school planning um, curriculum. And then last but not least, uh, probably my favorite um, resource that's available to you is the NextGen Personal Finance website. Um, again, NextGen Personal Finance is a nonprofit who has done a phenomenal job at um, going through all of the resources that are available um, for students um, related to personal finance. And they really have curated a, a whole variety of online resources and standalone activities that are available. Um, so if you hover over curriculum, you'll see that they have individual units available. They offer a full semester course, an eight-week course, an 18-hour and eight-hour workshop. So just to show you kind of quickly their curriculum. Resources, some of the resources that they offer, activities, games, quizzes. I mentioned the case studies earlier. Um, just a whole host of resources there for you to use with their students, with your students. They have a video library. Um, if you want kind of icebreaker activities or bell ringer activities, um, lots of great tools there. In their community section, they also have um, a blog. They have podcasts available, quick surveys, and a lot of contests. They also have professional development and other resources um, that are available. The other tool that I wanted to show you is, or the section of their website that I wanted to show you because I think this might be valuable for some of you, is their Fin Hero site. And so real quickly, their Fin Hero section of their website is an entire section on advocacy. And so the report that I referenced earlier that was done for high schools, um, and I uh, mentioned that they, they've studied high schools across the country, that report is included here. Um, there's a financial education advocacy toolkit that they have on their website that you can download. Perhaps you're trying to make the case on campus or at your school um, for the value of financial education. Um, there's even resources um, for you to reach out to your state senator in support of financial education. So I wanted to just be sure that you were aware of the Fin Hero um, website and the tools that are available through NextGen Personal Finance as well. And then last but not least, I wanted to make you aware uh, of some upcoming training opportunities that are available 
through the Maine Jumpstart Coalition um, in partnership with FAME, the Maine Office of Securities, the Maine Credit Union League, and many, many others. Um, coming up on May 11th at the Augusta Civic Center, um, we're hosting the ninth annual Fostering Financial Education in Maine Schools Conference. And so this is a day-long event dedicated specifically to this topic. Um, the agenda is available out there if you want to take a look at it. We have a number of um, educators, classroom teachers presenting workshops on best practices. We have a number of national speakers on hand. Um, Tim Ranzetta from NextGen Personal Finance will be attending. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will be on hand. We'll have a number of exhibitors available and tons of free resources. Um, the great thing about the Fostering um, Financial Education in Maine Schools Conference, it's a very small registration fee of $25. However, we, we waive the fee for anyone who is unable um, or, or doesn't have the resources to cover that. And so we do, um, we do waive the fee if needed. Also, for classroom teachers, through Maine Jumpstart Coalition and our partners, we also provide free substitute teacher reimbursement. So we will cover um, the cost of your substitute teacher if that expense limits your ability to attend. And so uh, that's something that's available. And so when you register, if you're interested in the fee waiver or the conference or substitute teacher reimbursement, you'll indicate that in the registration um, process. In addition to that training, coming up this summer, we're offering three FinCamp events. Um, and FinCamp is an event that was created by NextGen Personal Finance. They'll be coming back in August to do three events throughout the state where you will have an opportunity to build your lesson plan and your curriculum in partnership with NextGen Personal Finance and other main teachers. Um, as a follow-up to the webinar, I'll send you a link that is a quick video that shows you what FinCamp is, um, but we strongly encourage you to attend this free event. Um, the three sessions are exactly identical, so you can pick the one that's closest to you. Um, and uh, again, encourage you to share this information with anyone else that you think might be interested. And then last but not least on the training side, uh, the National Jumpstart Educator Conference, which is a multi-day conference specifically focused on financial education, will be held on November 3rd through the 5th this year um, in Cleveland, Ohio. And there are scholarships and resources available um, to help cover the registration fee as well. So those are our upcoming financial literacy trainings that we're offering that we want you to be aware of. The best place to find more information is the main Jumpstart website, mejumpstart.org. So we are right at 11 o'clock, which is perfect because that concludes, I, I really have reached the end of um, the webinar. Um, just to let you know, our next webinar is going to be on May 9th at 10 o'clock, and the topic is going to be saving for college. So we encourage you um, to attend that webinar as well. Um, I still don't see any questions in the question panel, so I think I will um, uh, leave, um, leave it open for a few minutes. But I think at this point, if any questions come up, I will email them to you. Again, thank you so much for attending the webinar today. I will be sending a recording to those of you um, who uh, may not have been able to attend for the entire hour. I will also be sending the final presentation or updated presentation along with all of the links to the free resources um, that I've shared today. So again, thank you so much for participating and thank you for your efforts. Um, that, that you have in, in place to support financial capability um, in your communities, on your campus, in your school. Um, we, we really appreciate all the great work that you're doing and happy Financial Literacy Month. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>